Assalamu alaikum students. So we continue with our circulation lectures and today we will discuss uh, blood pressure control, uh, both uh, acute, uh, look at it, uh, what are the acute mechanisms, i.e. short term, quick mechanisms and long term mechanisms. So basically there are two broad learning objectives today. One is the importance of blood pressure control uh, and the second are the actual mechanisms which uh, form a timeline uh, of how they address any change in blood pressure. So, uh, what's the whole, uh, the whole concept about? Uh, we mentioned this in the, in the initial part, uh, the first few lectures of circulation that uh, amongst the main three, four tenants of circulatory control, uh, cir circulation overall, one of those pillars uh, is actually blood pressure control. Uh, we we look at we, we look at the importance of things uh, by how much investment we do for a particular concept or or what or, or a mechanism. So today we, you will you will notice that uh, to control the blood pressure within a certain range. Uh, the body implies several mechanisms spanning over a, a very broad and impressive timeline uh, to keep this blood pressure in control. So why is it that blood pressure is so much important? Well, the one line answer is because it determines, uh, it's one of the main determinants of tissue perfusion, that the whole point of circulation is to supply blood to organs. And if you don't have adequate perfusion pressure, uh, you can't do that. Okay, so let me start with an example uh, uh, to justify this line that cardiovascular system needs to maintain just mean arterial pressure and that tissues just tap into it. Uh, think of uh, an over, overhead uh, water reservoir as you see in residential colonies all over uh, your cities. These big uh, sort of monuments of cities, which you can see from afar. Uh, these are big water collection reservoirs, which are intentionally made at a significant uh, height. Okay. Uh, so they are, they are, uh, they are way above uh, the average uh, height of houses, uh, flats and other residential schemes. So what's the point here? Why are they high and what's the whole architecture? So water is collected uh, by virtue of pumps. Uh, we call them donkey pumps. Uh, water is collected in these reservoirs, okay? And then it stays there. All, all th these tanks are then connected to their respective residential societies. And so for example, if you are a person living on the ground floor of a house, uh, all your taps, all your, uh, water su supply is connected to this eventually is connected to this uh, overhead huge water tank or water reservoir okay uh, all you need to do is open a tap okay because the pressure is so much because you have created a delta p a huge delta p by raising the water column way above the level of your house so when you, uh, you open up any tap of water, you let that whole column of uh, water to, to allow to come out of that tap. And hence you have flowing water. It's a very simple concept. So all you need to do is maintain the water presence in, that, in this tank and you will have running water. It's when you run out of the tank water is when you get problems with your water supply, right? So, it just just put this uh, very simple uh, example to the cardiovascular system that the heart and circulation together i.e cardiac output and total peripheral resistance okay you need to be comfortable with these two terms now they should ensure that the arterial side of circulation has adequate pressure so that whenever uh, an organ uh, needs to uh, uh, increase its uh, its uh, share of blood 
it can it can quote unquote just open up a tab okay uh, while at resting situation at resting condition uh, it is ensured that every organ will get their basal level blood supply anyway and in case as i said if if, if this uh, uh, requirement is to increase all they need to do is vasodilate their vessel i.e quote unquote open the tap and there will be increased blood okay so that's 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 why cardiovascular system rather than uh, going into every organ and trying to regulate it heavily uh, it's it's uh, really the organs are autonomous in their own blood supplies the cardiovascular system invests a lot in maintaining the central blood pressure if i may use this term which is called the arterial blood pressure just to ensure that the water tank is always filled up with water proverbial speaking proverbially speaking okay so <clears throat> there are two main factors main two main divisions of this regulation one is nervous uh, in which we will we'll, we'll study the various uh, uh, central nervous system mediated responses to uh, blood pressure regulation and the other is uh, hormone and this is the timeline that i was mentioning uh, it's divided into there are seven regulatory mechanisms so there, there it is uh, and it's divided across uh, three dimensions acute intermediate and long term these are time dimensions so acute means immediate intermediate means uh, uh, somewhere in between and long term means months and uh, uh, hours to uh, weeks to months and so on um, so this is what I was saying. Uh, acute is seconds to minutes. Intermediate is after many minutes. And long term is basically uh, weeks to years. Now, you will see a, a list of uh, uh, mechanisms under each heading. I just want you to just go through it and we'll be discussing each uh, in, in some detail. Acute, number one, the most famous is baroreceptor reflex. Number two is CNS ischemic response. Then you have the chemoreceptor response. Intermediate, you have again three and renin, angiotensin, vasoconstrictor uh, mechanism, stress relaxation, and fluid shift. And in the long term, you have renin, angiotensin, but it re replaced by aldosterone system. So, long term, in long term, you have basically an aldosterone system which addresses these things. Let me just uh, say a few words, general words, before we go into the nitty gritty of things. Uh, acute mechanisms should always be viewed as. Uh, uh, saving the day kind of mechanism. So if they don't come into play within literally seconds, uh, the whole game uh, may be lost. So if somebody comes in, uh, have experiences, God forbid, a road traffic accident and, and starts to bleed, uh, uh, the blood pressure will, will obviously plummet. Uh, there is no point in uh, this person uh, depending on his intermediate mechanisms or long-term mechanisms, if the acute mechanisms within seconds don't save the day for him, those few initial, few important, crucial hours uh, to save his life at, the, at that particular time so that afterwards these mechanisms can come and bring back the whole system back to normal. So during emergencies, during uh, uh, urgencies, uh, you will have your baroreceptor reflex working uh, in and out. Uh, uh, then you have the CNS ischemic response working as a last ditch response, as we will see. And chemoreceptor is a, a relatively minor concept in circulatory physiology. You have studied this in detail in respiratory physiology. Uh, so, so this is this is what I wanted to say about acute mechanisms as opposed to. Uh, later on mechanism especially the long term a few words about long term is usually uh, it relates to kidney as is as is the case here and kidney basically comes to the party late but the 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 feature of kidney is that it brings the whole uh, disturbance which got it involved in the first place back to normal dot Acute mechanisms are not known for their accuracy, uh, but kidney is, okay? Acute mechanisms are known for their speed, uh, and hence uh, the speed comes at some sort of a crudeness in, in, in terms of bringing the whole thing down to, uh, to naught. However, the long-term, i.e. kidney-mediated responses, 
although they are late to be triggered however uh, they 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 ha they are known for their accurate uh, uh, ringing the whole thing back uh, to normal so we start with the acute mechanisms and as i said the first is valve receptor the second is seen as ischemic response and the minor one is chemoreceptor mechanism first up is baroreceptor reflex so what are baroreceptors as the name indicates baroreceptors are basically pressure sensing receptors and uh, there are there are many uh, across circulation but two most famous uh, ones uh, are depicted here uh, at the bifurcation of the carotids okay right here uh, this uh, is the uh, carotid sinus and then uh, tucked underneath are the uh, aortic uh, baroreceptors right here you will also notice that they are uh, uh, their neighbors immediate neighbors are carotid and aortic chemoreceptors as well okay so baroreceptors and chemoreceptors basically they reside close by in the same site uh, uh, more found in uh, aorta and carotids but as i mentioned earlier they are also found elsewhere in the body however these are the ones which are which mediate the famous baroreceptor reflex okay as you can see this is a guyton diagram these these baroreceptors they basically have uh, uh, afferents uh, going up to the brain stem uh, where they where they integrate uh, with cns centers and then you have efferents coming down and doing their business okay this is a uh, this is a much more detailed uh, diagram uh, and here you will be introduced to when you read your books you'll be introduced to uh, this this center now where is this center this center is in the brain stem brain stem is medulla plus pons so remember you know if you have been to a, to a big nice hotel you'll always find there's a there's a section for businessmen uh, and it's called a business center and there you'll find all sorts of uh, uh, internet facilities fax photocopying uh, they used to have telex uh, back in the days now you have fax and all sorts of these things just to facilitate people who are doing business and have to communicate uh, correspond uh, with their companies far away this that the other so that's the business center so i usually use this word business center for brainstem because brainstem has your most important centers collected in one place you as you remember in respiratory physiology we studied that respiratory centers reside here so today you need to uh, uh, notice that the cardiovascular res uh, uh, regulatory nuclei neurons also reside here and the main collection uh, cascade of these neurons is basically the vasomotor center this is shown this is the vasomotor center and you can as you can see it has multiple uh, uh, nuclei in it so it's a collection of neurons and then within the collection you have specialized neurons doing their own business okay and this resides in brainstem ideally located for it to mediate um, uh, come in, uh, inf incoming information from the periphery uh, uh, take the dictation from cerebral cortex uh, but mainly uh, negotiating everything and maintaining everything under subconsciously automatically because all of this stuff under the cerebral cortex all of this stuff is uh, unconscious you don't have any control over it uh, you have control over your cerebral cortex however so uh, just a, just a parting note on the cerebral cortex basically this is your conscious control so yes when you are scared or when you are relaxed that has a, has a has an effect on your blood pressure because cerebral cortex as you can see here has an effect on hypothalamus which is the master gland master area uh, area i beg your pardon uh, it's the it's the main area uh, which has lots and lots of functions as you'll be studying in your next year of mbbs uh, uh, so higher centers do have an input on hypothalamus hypothalamus also controls blood pressure via the vasomotor center and hence any conscious uh, changes in mood uh, uh, any emergencies perceived any images which you you find either nice or disturbing sounds all that sort of thing memories they have an effect on blood pressure via 
this input okay uh, but when you talk about the mundane the day to day it's automatic and why is it automatic this is why it's automatic right so you know what afferents are these are uh, nerve uh, action potentials which are generated at the receptors and uh, they travel back to the CNS. In this case, all those uh, uh, barrel receptors at the aortic uh, arch and the carotids uh, bifurcation, they generate those uh, very important signals about blood pressure, any fluctuation in that, and send it off to the brainstem uh, vasomotor center, where in the vasomotor center, their port of first port of call is nucleus tractus solitarius NTS, Basically, this you should note uh, integrates all the afferent information about blood pressure, okay, and then like a good postal service disseminates uh, this information uh, in three directions. One is to send it off to higher uh, centers via the hypothalamus to give you a sensation of uh, uh, weirdness when the BP goes down or a slight tense, tense or uh, anxious when the BP goes up uh, then very importantly uh, look at this uh, input to the sympathetic uh, vasoconstrictor center uh, within the vasomotor center where short of it is the VMC uh, then there is a vagal vasodilator uh, or cardio decelerator center we will talk about this in a bit so when NTS receives all the afferent information it basically stimulates the vagal area and inhibits the sympathetic uh, area. This is an important point to note for first year medical students. This is one of those very common mistakes, uh, conceptual mistakes, silly mistake really, because it's very straightforward. You need to just remember that NTS, when stimulated by afferents, afferent information, it inhibits the sympathetic center and activates the vagal center okay this bit you need to remember okay and that within them there is obviously a negative uh, feedback loop so when sympathetic gets turned on as an example it is it will basically snub the vagal center and vice versa okay uh, this bit I'll, I, I won't go into details here because we'll be discussing baroreceptor reflex in detail in the next slides I will just complete this uh, whole discussion by saying that you now should remember, uh, should know that what is the effect of autonomic nervous system on the heart. So when, you, when, we, when we say that sympathetic stimulation is say uh, inhibited, uh, what will happen to the heart uh, when that happens? And if we say that vagal, uh, vagal or parasympathetic stimulation occurs, uh, increases, how will it affect the heart? You should be in a, 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 in a position to now comment on that, okay? Uh, well, very quickly, we'll say that parasympathetic stimulation basically sto slows down the heart uh, while it does not have a very high uh, effect on its contract contractility. Uh, sympathetic, on the other hand, has both effects. When it gets stimulated, it increases the heart rate and contractility, okay? So that's the heart done. Blood vessels, in blood vessels, Parasympathetic does not play a huge role. However, sympathetic does. Okay. And it all depends on, as we've been discussing, it all depends on the receptor, whether it's alpha one or beta one. Okay. So that's that. Uh, for this slide, you have understood uh, VMC, where it's located, uh, what does it constitute, uh, and very importantly, the circuit diagram of these three subnuclei. Now the baroreceptor reflex. So uh, basically uh, imagine that blood pressure has gone down due to whatever reason, blood pressure has gone down, okay? Uh, and when I say blood pressure, I basically mean mean arterial pressure, MAP, okay? That has gone down. So baroreceptor reflexes, basically they are stretch reflex, reflexes, okay? So at all times, in a, in a person who's alive, uh, he, he or she will have a blood pressure and hence there will be a constant force uh, on the walls of the, blood, of the blood vessels. So when you have a constant force acting on a vessel which contains a stretch receptor, you can imagine that that stretch receptor will be 
in a state of stretch at all times, right? Now what you've done is you have decreased that blood pressure. So the blood pressure has gone down, the degree of stretch of the wall has gone down, and so the receptor itself, the better receptor, has the degree of stretch on it has decreased, okay? So when that has decreased, as, as you can see here, uh, it's firing rate, because look, it's a stretch receptor. The more you stretch it, the more activation you cause in it, and hence it becomes more active, it then throws out more volleys of action potential along its afferent, uh, NTS receives more, inf uh, more uh, uh, supply of uh, incoming volleys of action potential, and it increases its, its, uh, uh, the three things that it, it's supposed to do, right? If you remember the VMC diagram. Now, in this scenario, you have decreased firing rate of, say, the carotid sinus nerve, okay? So you can imagine that the NTS in this case will receive less a number of impulses and all, all over it's uh, the function of it, what normally it's doing, if you remember, what is it doing? Let me just go back, refer you back to the VMC. What is the NTS doing? Normally, it is keeping a check, uh, an inhibitory check on the sympathetics and it's, it's normally activating the parasympathetics. Again, as I mentioned earlier, this is, an, this is a very crucial uh, circuit diagram that you need to remember. So in case of uh, uh, decreased blood pressure, uh, what we were discussing, what happens is uh, when these impulses decrease in, in their amount, as, in, as is the case with uh, blood pressure going down, decreasing blood pressure, uh, the NTS's inhibition on the sympathetic subnucleus, subneurons, uh, decreases, okay? Uh, to understand it, uh, let me give you the opposite. If you uh, overactivate NTS, okay, uh, this inhibition will increase naturally because that's the nature of relationship. But if you make it weak, okay, this is a better way of saying it. If you make it weak, the sympathetic will come out of its inhibition. Okay, the signals from NTS, if they weaken due to less activation from the afferents, because the stretch has decreased and also and, and all that story that I told you, this effect on sympathetic system dwindles, it goes down. And this effect on the, uh, the, 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 the vagus, uh, it basically decreases. So net result is sympathetic system will announce its liberty, uh, freedom from the inhibitory uh, tyrannical effect of the NTS uh, and it will activate itself, it will affect the heart, it will affect the blood vessels with what it's supposed to do, increase the heart rate, increase heart contractility, vasoconstrict the vessels and at the same time uh, uh, the, the, the parasympathetic uh, nuclei, they were actually being supported by the NTS but in this case since NTS has now weakened quote unquote, please don't write that, this is all conceptual uh, uh, since this has weakened the vagus basically sort of switches off and this sits in nicely with your activation of the sympathetic because these two don't see eye to eye and if vagus goes down uh, parasympathetic goes down uh, this uh, basically liberates the heart from any slowing down okay and sympathetics can now properly drive the heart in the positive direction so Coming back to the circuit diagram, remember the flow chart rather. Remember this is a this is the main flow chart. And if when you get a question uh, in your in your professional examination, we are expecting you to draw something like this to show your understanding, clear understanding of how you uh, uh, how you understand this whole thing. And it doesn't really matter if you get a generic question which does not give you a scenario in which uh, the 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 uh, whoever is suffering from uh, fluctuation blood pressure has uh, been shown to decrease his or her blood pressure or increase if you don't get that direction from your question it's really up to you whether you want to make this flow chart as a decrease in blood pressure flow chart or an increase in blood pressure flow chart both are equally valid so we we were at the decrease firing rate of carotid sinus part here and this basically now you can understand that this will 
all of the afferents going into NTS will actually decrease. Okay, this has an effect on the parasympathetic side of things and the parasympathetic side of things. Let's get this uh, out of the way first. Parasympathetic activity of the heart decreases. This in itself it raises the heart rate since you know that it doesn't have any significant uh, contribution towards the contractility. Uh, parasympathetics really are concerned with heart rate. Increasing heart rate will tend to improve uh, the cardiac output and hence blood pressure. Okay, it's the sympathetic side which uh, which has the the juice here. And by increasing activity of sympathetics to the heart and blood vessels, you have all sorts of things: increase heart rate, increase contractility. In the arterioles, you have increased TPR, total peripheral resistance, because of constriction. Uh, important point to note here, which often gets uh, uh, doesn't get enough attention uh, uh, from students, is the constriction of veins. We always talk about a constriction of arterioles, but now, uh, since it's a generic turn on of the sympathetic activity and sympathetics, as I mentioned earlier, uh, affect not just the arterioles but also the veins. Uh, so when you constrict a vein. Remember, veins have a reservoir function, and that that blood that they were holding up uh, for such an event basically now gets uh, into play. And uh, when it gets constricted, it basically gives out that reserved uh, stored volume, uh, improves the venous return. And when you know that venous return Im improves uh, with Frank starting law, you have increased cardiac output. Again, all of this contributes towards increasing in arterial blood pressure. PA here is arterial pressure, arterial blood pressure. So it's a classical reflex. It started off with decrease of pressure and ended up with an increase of pressure through a plethora of activities. Okay. Okay. That's, that's, that's done. That's battle receptor coming to CNS ischemic response. Remember we are talking about CNS ischemic. So alarm bells should go on uh, in your head. Uh, there is ischemia in the CNS what's going on here. And we did mention that battle receptor reflex do not work. Uh, below 60. Uh, they are exquisitely sensitive around 100. So what happens? Who is the hero below 60? Well, you're looking at it. So basically VMC, i.e. vasomotor center is residing in the uh, CNS as we mentioned and any ischemia, you know what ischemia is. Cerebral is uh, related to uh, cerebrum, i.e. the brain itself. Ischemia is less blood supply. Anything which drops the blood pressure to such an extent that it decreases blood supply to the brain, specifically the VMC, causes a strong excitation reaction from the VMC. Uh, sympathetics go haywire, okay, they are super uh, stimulated, which causes a massive vasoconstriction all over the body, okay, and the blood is diverted from all of the organs uh, to the brain. So imagine all the doors to the organs are either shut or nearly shut so that uh, the blood is diverted the, the entire volume is diverted to the brain because uh, if you can't save the brain in this situation then the whole thing is lost or the whole battle is lost so any cerebral ischemia is basically a very alarming situation in the body and the body literally shuts down uh, most of its circulation to save the brain by massively going into vasoconstriction. This is mediated by the sympathetic part of the vasomotor center that we are now uh, we have now recognized, um, and it's an emergency control system, and it kicks in only when the blood pressure falls below 60 mmHg uh, or even lower than that. Okay, so this is that brain ischemia, which uh, basically gets triggered by a decrease in systemic arterial pressure. Please remember this. CNS ischemic response are of two types. One type I've explained to you that the, the decrease in blood pressure is because of a disturbance in the systemic circulation elsewhere. The second type is called Cushing's reaction. Okay. The only difference, the, the reaction is the same. The only difference is in this case, the disturbance comes from within the brain itself. So the ischemia, the cause of ischemia is different. Here, the cause of ischemia is outside of the brain. Here, it's within the brain. So any tumor or any other, uh, say hydrocephalus, any other situation which causes increased intracranial pressure will cause uh, uh, constriction of the uh, snubbing of the arteries, narrowing of the arteries of the cerebrum, and 
Exa exactly the same thing would happen. Ischemia would happen, okay? And when ischemia would happen, again, uh, blood supply to the VMC will decrease and the same cascade of reactions will be done uh, to save the brain blood supply. The only difference here is that the instigation, the trigger happens to be the brain itself, okay? This is an important viva question. Okay. Having done that, we go to the uh, relatively minor uh, chemoreceptor mechanisms. Remember the role of peripheral and central chemoreceptors. I've uh, recorded detailed uh, videos, video lectures on the role of peripheral chemoreceptors and central chemoreceptors. Uh, here, their role is not very major. Uh, so their role in blood pressure control is this basically. Uh, if you remember peripheral chemoreceptors, they, they reside uh, again, neck, right next to their brothers, the barrel receptors uh, 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 under the arch of aorta and at the bifurcation of carotids. Uh, and if you remember, th their, their main stimulation is a drop in PO2. Uh, and if you really remember those lectures, you would remember that hypoxia or decreased uh, arterial uh, oxygen tension coupled with an increase uh, in carbon dioxide and uh, hydrogen ions really ramps up uh, the peripheral chemoreceptor response. Uh, uh, lone decreases in PO2 uh, are less potent than uh, decreases in PO2 coupled with increases in uh, carbon dioxide and uh, hydrogen ions. Anyhow, so uh, this is the main stimulus with or without the uh, carbon dioxide hydrogen business. Uh, when the arterial PO2 goes down, it stimulates uh, the, the, these peripheral chemoreceptors located here. Uh, which now you will study. This is new information for you. Uh, over there, you studied in respiration, you studied that when hypoxia happens, it basically gets, they get stimulated, the peripheral chemoreceptors, and then they uh, trigger the, the DRG, the respiratory uh, centers in the brainstem, and all sorts of increased ventilatory efforts then uh, starts to be triggered. But here, we are obviously discussing uh, circulation. So the same stimulus, Besides turning on the ventilation, now you study that it also has an effect on the sympathetic vasoconstrictor center of the uh, VMC and it causes vasoconstriction on in the major organs uh, so that the blood is uh, made available uh, in the arteries. It stays in the arteries uh, so that it goes up. Uh, the arterial blood pressure goes up. So basically what is happening is uh, in this uh, mechanism, a decrease in, or let's say a change in PO2 is translated into circulation language, okay? So a decrease in PO2 is uh, read as a decrease in blood pressure, okay? And hence sympathetics are turned on and vasoconstriction takes place, okay? There's a footnote here that it, this also causes a transient heart rate, a decrease in heart rate. Uh, by activating of uh, uh, parasympathetics, but this is a transient thing and it uh, sort of uh, fades away uh, quickly. Uh, then you come to the central chemoreceptor, you know the location, It's uh, they are part uh, and parcel of the medulla again. Medulla comes in again in the discussion. Uh, they're part of the brain and uh, in Cushing reaction type situation or anything which uh, basically uh, leads to CNS ischemia, cerebral ischemia, uh, what, what would happen in that uh, is uh, carbon dioxide will start to immediately go up, hydrogen ions will start to go up, and uh, uh, what happens is central chemoreceptors, as you remember, they have not much to do with oxygen. However, they are very, very uh, respondent to the hydrogen ion concentration and the carbon dioxide. So in this case, when you have ischemia, all sorts of stimulatory signals are now going to activate the, the central chemoreceptors, which detect these changes and directly increase, again, the sympathetic outflow, which again causes vasoconstriction, and the blood is diverted to the brain. And Cushing's reaction, uh, the, the same thing happens, it's just that the, the, the place of, uh, the cause of ischemia is the brain itself. Uh, again, finishing this off by saying that this is a minor component. However, it's an, it's an important tail, quote unquote, of the whole acute mechanisms. We then hop over to the intermediate mechanisms. Intermediate mechanisms are less tricky, so good news for you. And uh, uh, basically, Guyton's, I guess, mentions these three 
uh, these uh, uh, are there as well. They are, they are the hormonal component to this uh, whole uh, story. Uh, but these three are basically what the examiner will be looking at uh, when uh, you get a, a question on the intermediate mechanisms. One is fluid shift, second is stress relaxation, and then uh, basically a renin-based uh, vasoconstrictor mechanism. Uh, so quickly, we, we talk about fluid shift. So imagine if you have an increase in blood pressure and it, it has not been, a, very importantly, it has not been addressed by the acute mechanisms. So it has stayed over on that timeline. Now the intermediate mechanisms come into play, okay? And one of those is, is fluid shift. So at the capillary level, uh, simply put, the fluid will come out of the capillary, bringing down the volume inside the, inside the blood vessels, and that will decrease the blood pressure. This is as simple as that. Uh, stress relaxation, again, is a very simple mechanism. Uh, and again, let me mark my words here. You, you have a sustained blood pressure disturbance which has not been addressed by uh, the acute mechanisms and uh, it has now come to the intermediate mechanisms. So the number two thing to study is stress relaxation. It's literally as the name says, the vessels will dilate in response to a sustained increase in blood pressure and when they dilate, they, the blood pressure comes down. Remember, fluid shift and stress relaxation are equally uh, applicable on the vice versa situations, i.e. a decrease in blood pressure will cause fluid shift from the interstitium into the vessels and stress relaxation will, de will basically decrease uh, causing vasoconstriction if the blood pressure has gone down. Coming to renin-angiotensin vasoconstrictor mechanism, this is, a, this is a main mechanism and let me just uh, tell you here that it has two components. One is you're seeing it, the vasoconstrictor element of it. There is another aspect, the aldosterone uh, aspect. That then will take you into the long term. So be very, very clear about this system. Renin, angiotensin, vasoconstrictor mechanism, and renin, angiotensin, aldosterone mechanism. The aldosterone one is the long term. Uh, a way to remember it is again, uh, manipulating the diameter of vessels is a quick fix method. So vasoconstrictor mechanism is a quick fix. So it will, in a timeline, it will come in earlier than long term. However, uh, anything which has to do with A, kidney, B, blood volume itself, not the diameter of vessel, this will take time. Hormones take time. Remember whichever bit you remember uh, better. Hormones take time to work. Aldosterone is a hormone. It will take time for it to be released from the adrenal gland. It will take time for it to rise up in the blood gradually. And then eventually it will start acting on the kidney to cause blood volume changes. Okay. This is all a long, long scenario. Not very long, but it, 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 it takes days to set in. Okay. When we talk about the vasoconstrictor uh, component of the renin-angiotensin system, basically it comes in the intermediate uh, sort of things because before this, the mighty baroreceptor is doing its business. But when that doesn't come to work and that uh, the, flat, uh, the curve is flattened of the baroreceptor reflex, you have renin-angiotensin trying to save the day. Um, and we'll talk about this in, in, a, in a flow chart way in the, in the coming slide. So let me just say this that this mechanisms, this component comes under the intermediate mechanisms. Then you have vasoconstrictors and vasodilators. We have discussed this role of epinephrine, the, the receptors. Uh, you can ha have a, a good read of this uh, from your textbooks. So this is intermediate mechanisms uh, controlling blood pressure. Now the long term. Long term is really, uh, uh, Three, three things, uh, more of this is one thing. Uh, main thing is the aldosterone bit. But let me just get, let me get this out of the way because that mentions it at the, the onset of the uh, second chapter, it mentions uh, pressure diuresis, natural diuresis and diuresis. So this, these are crude mechanisms. Uh, you have a barbecue meal, okay? Um, you get thirsty. So what is happening is barbecue meal, why? 
is barbecue is high on salt and all those masalas uh, that you have in it, uh, which makes it uh, tasty. Uh, but at the same time, then it triggers a thirst response by which, by virtue of which you increase fluid intake as well. So basically you're flooding the, the cardiovascular system with a, with a lot of fluid, both salt and water. Uh, the kidney will simply uh, increase the salt output which is referred to as natriuresis and increase the water output, which is referred to as diuresis in the ensuing minutes to hours so that uh, the atrocity that you caused by having this meal and its attendant fluid is, is uh, uh, worked out, sorted out and extra salt is thrown out, extra water is thrown out and that's it. This is basically these two terms uh, really simplified. Guyton does go into details, graphical details. Uh, uh, by graphical, I don't mean those graphical details. Graph-based details, uh, and basically uh, mentioning the, the same basic concept that I've described. With this out of the way, look at this. This is the main renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. In the intermediate mechanisms, we studied renin-angiotensin vasoconstrictor mechanism. That is intermediate. This now, by virtue of a hormone, is long term. So what's happening? What's happening is you again start the proceeding with a decrease uh, arterial blood pressure scenario. Okay, but in this case, we are looking at how the kidney gets affected by this whole thing. As I mentioned to you, the cardiovascular system, uh, the mainstay of the cardiovascular system, is to maintain mean arterial pressure. You didn't do that here. So it got decreased. When it got decreased, since mean arterial pressure ensures tissue perfusion, and if you decreased it, tissue perfusion will drop, renal tissue perfusion is no exception. Okay. So in this case, as soon as the mean arterial pressure dropped, you have a decrease in renal perfusion pressure, which then, uh, and this is second year stuff really, so just, just remember this, uh, decreased renal pressure, uh, perfusion pressure leads to release of a hormone called renin. You probably have studied it in, in your A-levels and your FSC uh, that renin gets released by the kidney. Let's, let's keep it at that. And renin being a hormone basically needs a substrate. So angiotensinogen is a plasma protein. Again, remember this, please. This is one of, I, it's crazy that such a simple information can be uh, turned into a mistake. It's not angiotensin, it's angiotensinogen. This is the substrate on which renin acts, makes it angiotensin 1. Then angiotensin 1 itself is not very active. Angiotensin 1 gets converted into angiotensin 2 by angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE, A-C-E. Remember the, the hypertension book to, uh, to read summaries of things. Uh, so angiotensin 2 basically increases aldosterone uh, and aldosterone is known for its sodium reabsorption by the tubule, the renal tubule, uh, not the PCT, not the proximal coronary tubule, but in case of aldosterone, it acts on the distal convoluted tubule to increase sodium reabsorption by the DCT. And then again, as whenever you study, whenever you look at sodium, you should think about volume. Increase sodium reabsorption will enhance the ECF volume, and that will then bring the blood pressure back to normal. This is the renin angiotensin to aldosterone system, which is the mainstay of the long-term mechanisms uh, which bring the blood pressure or keep the blood pressure to within normal range.